Okay, so do we have a lot of front end developers here? Yeah, hands up. I can't see. Oh, yeah. Okay, lots. So how do how do you guys feel? You guys feel overwhelmed at times? Put your hand up if you feel overwhelmed at trying to keep up with everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, don't worry. At the end of this presentation, I guarantee you, you will feel ten times worse. All right. So. A little about me, he gave you a little introduction a minute ago. I work for SitePoint. I have a couple of books that I've helped to author, and I'm known online as Impressive Webs. Um, so when it comes to front-end tools, I think we're familiar with many of the typical options, uh, what's out there, bootstraps and boiler straps and jock straps and Angular and so forth. Grunt is really big right now. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the ones listed here. Um, I run, uh, though, a weekly newsletter called Web Tools Weekly. Maybe a few of you have seen it. I've been doing this for almost two years now, and I've come across just a ridiculous uh, number of tools. And, you know, that's why many of your hands went up when I asked you if you're overwhelmed. So I thought I would kind of go through um, some really cool tools that I've come across, uh, maybe that you all haven't heard of yet. Um, some of them have made the rounds in the developer industry, so you might have seen a few of them. But I tried to pick some that are really cool and practical and uh, that have really nice APIs and such. And some of them will be HTML, CSS, and SAS tools. I'll move on to some JavaScript stuff, uh, some command line things. And at the end, we'll take a few minutes and I'll just help you to see how we can cope with all of this madness and deal with the fact that there's just an endless number of things available uh, in the front-end industry right now. So again, you're probably feeling overwhelmed. You're not sure if you can keep up. Is there any point in trying? Well, let's just uh, first look, run through a bunch of really neat tools. So if you're taking notes or maybe punching stuff into your laptop, just know that at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you one link that will take you to a page that lists everything in my presentation, including the slides. So if you don't want to sit there rushing through, I, I am going to go a little bit quick at times, so if you can't keep up with uh, taking notes or something or punching stuff into your laptop or whatever, uh, don't worry. Just sit back, grab a beer, put your feet up, and enjoy, and then you can grab the link at the end. So let's take a look at some HTML, CSS, and a couple of SAS things. Uh, did anybody used to do XHTML websites. Uh, we have a lot of former XHTML. Remember when we used to do the validation? I'm sure you we still do validation to some degree, but I don't think any of my websites validate today uh, because it just it's just useless, really. It's not extremely practical. It's a good basic guide to kind of get you started to make you make sure you don't have any major errors. But the practicality of getting everything, getting all the tags closed and getting everything exactly right to get this green screen of uh, approval from the validator is kind of not extremely practical. Uh, you can have a few validation errors and your page will run just fine in all browsers. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of tools that I think are much more superior that you can kind of use on top of the validator or maybe even instead of the validator. This is one called HTML Inspector. So it's a code quality tool to help you and your team write better markup. So it's just written in JavaScript. You run a script on your page. And you can see I've run it on uh, one of my websites here. It's kind of a semi-old website, so I figured it would have some coding issues to deal with. And it just shows you there a, a little output in the console, and you can start correcting some stuff. And the stuff that it gives you recommendations on for your code is actually more a little more practical than you know just trying to close tags that really didn't need to be closed to begin with. So uh, that's one. And the great thing about HTML Inspector is that it actually is configurable. So there's a lot of options, as you can see there, for configuring it, and it allows you to write your own coding standard rules. So if you have like an intern or someone who's coming to work with you and you want him to write your style of code, this is really cool because you can create your own rules and then you don't even have to explain your coding HTML and CSS coding standard to him. He can just run the script and it'll output in the console all the things he's kind of done wrong and he can make the correction, he or she can make the corrections themselves. So really nice uh, option there for 
code quality. Another one very similar is called HTML code sniffer. Um, same idea. They have some custom standards that it's based on, but you can also add to it. Um, it's just based on JavaScript again. You can add to it and add your own coding standards. And you do it kind of like a validator, the W3C validator. Uh, punch in your HTML there, and then it gives you some options what to test it against. And I like it that it's actually something practical, accessibility, right? Um, it'll actually give you some results based on those particular accessibility tests. So you specify which one you want, Section 508, WCAG 2.0, etc., And then it gives you test results, something like that, right there on the page. Uh, here's another one called DOM Monster. So it's uh, described as a cross-platform, cross-browser bookmarklet that will analyze the DOM and other features of the page you're on and give you its bill of health. So again, a lot more practical suggestions from this one, kind of like what we saw in HTML Inspector. Uh, it prints out a, a little window overlay, something like that. I actually enlarged the window just to show for the slides, but the window actually appears a little bit smaller than that. Um, yeah, so really good suggestions there, and you see the site that I tested it on wasn't doing too badly, looking at the uh, green boxes there on the left, but there are some suggestions there on how to make some improvements. So again, just really practical suggestions, uh, much more practical, I think, than what the validator has given us back in XHTML or even now in HTML5. Here's a neat little thing called DOM flags. So it lets you create keyboard shortcuts to DOM elements. So sometimes if you've got really deep nested objects in your HTML and normally you'll right click to open the developer tools and inspect that particular element but sometimes it's tough to get right to a particular HTML element in your developer tools so this will actually allow you to add little flags so you can bookmark elements in your HTML because sometimes you'll right click or something and you can't even find the element you have to go digging through the HTML to find it and so you can create little bookmarks and it'll put a little window up on the top of the developer tools, just like what you see there, with the shortcuts to the flags that you've set in your HTML. So that's pretty neat, because you can just go really quickly back and forth to really deeply nested DOM elements. So if that's something you're having trouble with, uh, save you a lot of time creating little shortcuts like that. This is a tool called UCSS. It helps you to find unused and duplicate CSS. I think we've all been there. If you've built really big CSS projects, you just keep adding styles at the bottom of your file. Certainly we shouldn't be doing that, but if you've done that in the past and you want to clean up some old CSS, uh, just run this on the command line and you'll get an output something like that. In this case, it, it spit out the reset styles, um, which doesn't tell you a whole lot because you know the reset styles aren't necessarily being used, but normally you'll get something like that where all sorts of selectors are shown that maybe you should be either removing or um, combining with another one to be a little more modular. Okay, this is something called Extract CSS that just lets you create a skeleton of your uh, CSS file based on your HTML. So normally we'll start coding our HTML first and we might even get all of that in place. So you just put that into the text area box there on the left, and it'll spit out a, a CSS file, a skeleton, based on the selectors uh, that you've basically built in your HTML. So you can have some options there on the side, whether or not you want to extract the IDs. Maybe you just use IDs for JavaScript, so you can choose not to extract those. Um, you can choose to extract the inline styles that might be in the HTML, and even has a few options for curly braces and spaces and whatnot. Uh, and this is a very similar tool. In this case, you just upload the HTML file, and it'll spit out a, a CSS skeleton for you. So you don't have to write any selectors, uh, just like you see there on the right. Um, it'll build the selectors for you, and then you just start typing your properties and values in your CSS declaration boxes, uh, de declaration blocks. Okay, if you develop websites that uh, need to be translated into right-to-left languages, like maybe Arabic or Hebrew, then this might come in handy. This is called CSS Flip. And so basically you run this on the command line, and it'll produce a new CSS file uh, reversing certain CSS declarations. And the, if your CSS file is called style.css, 
it'll produce a file called style.rtl.css or something like that. So you'll have something like this in your CSS, three uh, declarations, text align left, float left, padding left, and it'll convert it to what you see there in the second instance. Text align right, float right, padding right. So it only works on certain properties, of course, because those are dealing with left and right in your layout. So, but if you want, you can actually tell it not to flip certain properties by just adding a no flip flag next to one of the lines or next above an entire declaration block. So it'll ignore the entire second block there as well as the third line in the first block. So again, if you have a use for translating into Hebrew or Arabic or another right to left language, that could be a really quick way to do that and then you could go through your, your file and just make any needed corrections if it doesn't do everything you need it to do. So CSS animations are pretty big right now. If you've got some really dynamic stuff going on and you want to modify and create and remove keyframe animations with JavaScript, maybe this library will help. It's a little bit old. It hasn't been touched in a couple of years, but CSS animations haven't changed much in the last couple of years, so I'm thinking it's probably still safe to use. Uh, really nice, clean API. Uh, you can see, you can get a CSS animation based on the name right there with the get method and then define an individual keyframe with that second line you see there. And then in the when you're creating an entire animation, you can create all the keyframes at once using the little create method there. So that's pretty neat, a nice clean API to be able to build animations with JavaScript uh, if you need to do that. Okay, so here's an interesting one. I'm not sure of the accessibility implications of this. Uh, most screen readers and whatnot do run JavaScript, so this, I'm assuming it should be okay, but you'd want to check on that first. It's called responsive comments. So responsive web design is really big right now, so it adds a solution to creating breakpoints right in your HTML, and it's based on, as they explain here, the fact that JavaScript can actually read HTML comments. So just like any DOM node, an HTML comment is a, a node. It's actually a type 8 node. So your HTML would basically look like this. And you'll see that based on the breakpoints you see there, what will be displayed in each of those elements is inside of the HTML comments. So again, I have no idea if this has accessibility implications, but basically the, that content will be pulled out by JavaScript, and then it will be put back in uh, depending on the, the user's window size. Okay, so if you're doing responsive design, this is actually a hardware tool that you might find useful. A company that's actually built a, a little stand that you can put together your own little device lab. So if you're doing testing on all sorts of small devices, you might want to pick up one of these. Again, I'll have a link at the end where you can uh, link to that if, you, if you're interested, if your team's interested in looking at something like that, building a little device lab. Okay, this one is going to put all you guys out of business, all right? So this is, <laughs> this is called AI to HTML. It's an open source script for Adobe Illustrator that converts your Illustrator documents into HTML and CSS. So it's built by the New York Times, which is really cool. Some really big companies now are doing open source, which is really great. And they actually show you some examples of how it's been used by them and some other organizations. Um, and it looks great. Uh, I, I was only kidding about putting us out of business. I don't think that's going to happen. But if you've got like a, just a quick little microsite or a, an ad-based site or a landing page or something, your, your designer gives you the Illustrator file, just tell them you spent 20 hours coding it and use one of these. That would be great. So uh, moving on to a couple of SaaS things. This is just a, a tool that actually converts from CSS to SaaS or to SCSS. So I think it would be useful if you're just getting into SAS and you just kind of want to get an idea of what one of your style sheets would look like with SAS. Uh, you just throw your CSS into the box there. It's got lots of different options as shown there. And uh, here's another tool, very similar idea, CSS to SAS. So instead of compiling from SAS to CSS like we normally do, this is actually doing the complete opposite. In my opinion, I don't find it all that useful, but I think it would be useful for maybe beginners to SAS just to get an idea of what the syntax would look like and what kind of things would be created in your own uh, style of coding in, in a SAS document. 
So if you're using Modernizer and SAS, you might want to check out Modernizer Mixin. A Modernizer allows you to hook into uh, classes that Modernizer puts into your HTML element of your pages. Sometimes we'll use that to create kind of a, a forking in our CSS. So let's say we want to do something specific. If you look at the second example there, we might be doing something specific based on the existence of transforms, but then we want to do something else when transforms are missing. But you can see how convoluted the code gets with the no translate 3D and so forth. Uh, the, this little library or this little mixin allows you to just use those includes you see at the top and it'll, it'll compile to what you see at the bottom. So it's kind of a yep, nope syntax. Uh, very simple to use, nice, clean, and uh, yeah, might, you might want to look into that if you're using Modernizer and SAS. Uh, if you're deep into SAS at this point, you might want to try SCSS Lint. I'm sure we've all heard of JS Lint, JS Hint, similar tools like that. Uh, this is a linting tool for your SCSS files. So you run that on the command line and you'll get an output that looks like that. You can output that to a text file as well. And yeah, some nice suggestions there to clean up your SAS code. It's, again, probably good for beginners to SAS to make sure you're doing things in a maintainable and effective way with your code. Okay, are we out of breath yet? Is that all right? <laughs> so let's move on to some JavaScript stuff. Um, this is really neat. Uh, we all love writing regular expressions, right? You guys love writing regular expressions? No, I hate them. I can't stand them. So this is called JS Verbal Expressions, and it just regular expressions made easy. Nice clean API. Uh, you can see there, here we're testing for the existence of a URL. It gives you a start of line and end of line, and then in, in between, we're doing just some basic checks. It's just like you would do in a regular expression, except it's actually English. So uh, look at you're telling the the API to look at HTTP first. Make sure you have that. You might have S beside it. Then you might have. Then you will have uh, colon forward slash forward slash, and then maybe www, and then anything but a space. It's just very simple to read and write. And the great thing is that object that gets created, the tester variable there, will get output at the bottom of the screen. If you can see that, it'll actually output the uh, the actual regular expression that you've built. So that's pretty cool. You can actually learn a few things about regular expressions as well with that little library. Okay, so uh, this is called RE Fiddle or Re Fiddle. I'm not sure how they pronounce it, but it's a regular expression fiddle, just like JS Fiddle, that sort of thing. So you can do some advanced stuff on there if that's your thing, and you can even click on tags that's shown there on the left and see existing. Uh, regular expressions that people have built. Uh, this one based on a US phone number. So if we test out that particular one, we'll get something like this. So the green lines are the ones that it accepts according to the regular expression there, and the one with all the nines in it are, is the one that it does not accept. So it tells you uh, passing and failing. So when you're writing your regular expressions, it gives you a nice indication of whether you're writing them correctly. So you might want to look into that. Here's a tool called JSON Select. So it's CSS-like selectors for JSON. Sometimes it can be a little complicated to, to find deeply nested uh, JSON data using JavaScript. So here's an example of how it's used. So the, what's indicated in green on the left is what's selected in right, uh, in yellow on the, on the right there. So you can see the selector is very similar to what we find in CSS. And so you just plug that library in and you're able to do JSON selection just very easily like that. There's another example um, using, you can even use select a sp specifically a string and then choose to, an odd numbered child. And very similar, this is called JSON selector generator. So you paste in your JSON data, you process it, and then you get an output like this. So you select what you want as indicated by the blue. So the page will show you what's selected with that blue. I didn't add the blue, I added just the red parts. And then what you see at the top is the actual selection. So again, if you've got like really deeply nested JSON data and you just don't want to bother figuring it out, just paste it, paste your data into this 
tool here, and then it'll tell you, based on what you select down below, what the, what the code is to select that uh, up top there. And there's another example, the blue selected down at the bottom of the screen there, and then what you see at the top, that's your selector that you would put in your JavaScript to grab that data. If you have the need to parse uh, CSV data, comma-separated value data, this is a really neat library, very powerful, called Papa Parse. And what's great about it is it actually handles, apparently, gigabytes of file sizes. So, yeah, if you're dealing with that kind of thing and you want to parse CSV data with JavaScript, that's the library you want to look into. You know, lots of really neat features as listed there. This is a, a library called JSZip, and it just, it's got great browser support, apparently going back to IE6, and really nice, clean API, again. Create a JSZip object, add your file, add your data, all sorts of things, and it's just very easy to use, and good browser support. So here's one called Anyang, so it's speech recognition. So let's you allow visitors to your website to control the website with voice commands. And it's really easy to, to create the commands. Um, for example, they have some examples there. If you say, show me cute kittens, it'll display a bunch of uh, kitten images right there on the page, Ajaxing them in. So the, the code works a little like this. You put the library into your page, and then you just have to define your commands, just like you see there. So if you want the command, show me cute kittens, that's what the user will, will speak into their microphone. So something maybe for accessibility, if a user is not able to use a mouse or a keyboard, they can actually just speak the commands. And then in the, what you see there in the comment will be the, your code to run when they say that particular command. So it's really nice because you don't have to actually tap into the microphone APIs and all that stuff. Just very simple. Define your commands and then execute them with the code you see indicated there. Okay. Am I going too fast for you down there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you go to Twitter and you hit the question mark key on your keyboard, you'll get a little pop-up window like this. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed that before. So it's just a little help menu for keyboard shortcuts on Twitter. You get the same thing on Google Plus and also on Google Drive. Same thing, you just hit the question mark. It's kind of a standard thing, I think, that apps have been doing. So I actually wrote a script of my own that does this, so you can add it to any app. It's called questionmark.js. Um, yeah, you just modify the HTML file with whatever help material you want to add. It starts out with uh, keyboard shortcuts, just like that, uh, but you can put whatever help content you want. So just hit the keyboard, hit the question mark key on your keyboard, and it brings up a little modal window like that for the user to see keyboard shortcuts or any other help info that you want to provide for them. Okay, this is really neat. It's called background check, and it automatically allows elements to recognize what's below them. So just to give you an example here, you can see the circle, the blue circle at the top. I've dragged that circle onto the bathtub in the photo, and the circle automatically turns black because it recognizes that it's on a white background. So if I move that circle just down slightly to the bottom of the, ba of the bathtub there, then it turns white. So it's, that's pretty neat because you don't have to do anything coding behind the scenes. It does it all for you to recognize what's kind of behind. And it gives you some really practical use cases for this. Um, one of them is like a little carousel or image slider, which we shouldn't be overusing. We know that, right? But you notice the white handle on the right there? So on a darkish kind of image that you see here, it'll, the handle will be white. But then when the screen scrolls over to the next image, because there's a lighter background, the handles will actually turn dark. So that's really nice. And they give you some other use cases on their page as well. Definitely check that out if that's something you want to do. Okay, this one is probably completely useless, but <laughs> it actually adds... Uh, a countdown to your fave icon uh, that you see. You can, I don't know if you can see it very well up in the top of the tab there. You see the number 32. So that will actually be a dynamic counter in the, in the uh, fave icon, overlaid over your actual icon. I'm going to come back to this a little later, but I don't know. I guess you could use that on a 
a tab that's not in use or something like that. Maybe some kind of a countdown for something that's completing. I don't know. I'm not sure the use cases, but it seems pretty neat that they can do that. This is a little library called Exceptions JS. It's a library and a service. And as they explain here, it allows you to receive an email with a stack trace, a screenshot, and a DOM dump with, and browser information every time a user hits a JavaScript error. So that's pretty cool. Um, get lots of information based on errors, maybe really obscure edge cases that you haven't been able to try out. Um, and you can see them in your email. The, the, the info it emails you is kind of complex, but engineers, I'm sure, would be uh, benefit greatly from something like that. Okay, here's another one, very similar to the regular expressions, verbal to the verbal expressions library that we saw earlier. It's called is, so it's a better way to write JavaScript conditional statements and still have really nice looking code. So we've all seen this kind of thing. It doesn't look very pretty. It's kind of hard to understand what's going on. Um, nested if statements, a um, couple of else statements in there as well. So you can, that exact same code can be written just like this. Same idea as what we looked at earlier. It's just a very simple kind of English language API. You tell it you want it to be longer than, equal to, not equal to, and then run, do kind of your success and failure uh, functions there. It's just very easy, and like I said, this code that you see there, that's exactly the same code as this, just using the library. It's much cleaner and easier to read. So this is called HTML.js. It's a fork of another project called voyeur.js, and it's just very similar to the JSON selector we saw. So instead of selecting JSON data, you're actually selecting HTML elements. And here's what it looks like. Just like, kind of like CSS or jQuery, where you're selecting based on uh, the dot operator. And you can see it gives you an indication of what you selected there, all the section elements on the page. So that's right in your JavaScript. You write it just like that after you include the library. Nice and clean. You don't have to deal with all the get element by ID and get elements by tag name and looping through stuff. Uh, kind of the same idea as what jQuery does, uh, but it's, it almost looks like a very much cleaner API than even what jQuery provides. So uh, we know that when it comes to performance, images are probably one of the biggest problems with performance. Images are just really big. Um, so this is a tool that allows you to discover your image weight on the web. So you run it on the command line and it gives you kind of a bill of health in terms of image weight. Um, I ran it on one of my sites, not doing too bad, not very good on mobile, some improvements I can make there on mobile, but um, and it gives you a comparison to other sites, top sites in that particular area. And uh, you can even run it with the verbose mode flag, and it gives you specifics on every single image that it finds on the page. So I ran it, <laughs> shamelessly, I ran it on the uh, FITC website, but you can see they have some improvements to make there. And this will probably be my last talk at FITC. Okay. So, okay, let's move on to some uh, text editor stuff. Some really cool stuff that we can look at. Uh, how am I doing on time? Cool, cool. Okay, thanks. So, I'm sure some of us have, have used Coda. Coda used to be pretty big. That's the logo there on the right. Uh, Sublime Text has kind of taken over the reins of the most popular text editor. Well, this is something called Diet Coda. It's actually a, a text editor for your iPad. So there are a few of these that I've seen. Um, I'm not really sure how well they work. I haven't tried it out, but that's pretty cool. You can hook it into your, uh, or install it on your iPad there, and who knows, try that out if that's something you're interested in coding on your iPad. This is something called Flubits and it lets you code with another developer like you're in the same room. So it kind of gives you an example of what it looks like there. Hipster talking to his buddy uh, while they're coding there. So yeah, you can check that out if you want. I think, I believe, if I remember correctly, it hooks into um, Google Hangouts, if I remember correctly. That's how they do it. Um, I just kind of find it kind of funny. They have a couple of testimonials. I tell everyone I know about Flubits, it's freaking amazing. And then the founder, he says, Flubits works pretty well most of the time. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's supposed to be a joke or what, but 
I, I thought it was, the school was pretty cool. So check it out if that's something you want to try out. Um, this is something called GIST. It's a sublime text plugin for creating new GIFs from selected text. So if you're in your text editor and you select some code, right click on it, and it'll give you the option to create a public GIST or a private GIST. You just gotta set it up in GitHub first. It's not too difficult. It gives you the instructions step by step right on the uh, repository there. Nice idea there if you wanna create GIFs right from your text editor. Uh, this is very similar to CodePen. I'm sure we've all heard of CodePen or most of us have tried it. Uh, it's called Live Weave, and what I really like about it is it has autocomplete. So when you're writing your CSS, it may be good for beginners. Writing CSS, you can see all the different CSS properties that are possible when you type a specific letter. And same thing with HTML elements. It will give you some autocomplete options, and even JavaScript. So starting to type in F there, it tells you that you might be typing a for loop, and then it gives you even a description of it. It's a really nice little helper. It seems to perform well, too. Uh, I didn't create anything really large, but I didn't see much slowdown. That was one of the reasons I was talking to Chris Coyer of CodePen, and he said performance is the main reason they don't have autocomplete on theirs. But if you want autocomplete on a, a code playground, check, that, check out LiveWeave. Uh, this is Sublime Git, full-featured Git integration for Sublime Text. So if you're using both Git and Sublime Text, like many of us, I'm sure, are, Maybe you want to check that out. And this is a web inspector for Sublime. So you're doing, you're actually doing a JavaScript debugging right inside your text editor with this. So this one kind of made the rounds, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago now. Um, so I don't know how, how good that is, but very similar to what you find in your developer tools with JavaScript debugging, but right inside of Sublime text. Okay, this is one of my favorites. It's called Waka Time. And it has plugins for all sorts of text editors as listed here. So it will actually automatically track your time spent in each project open, that's open in your text editor. So if you're switching between text, uh, between projects in Sublime Text or whatever text editor you're using and you're hooked into this service, it'll actually track your time for you. So you don't have to sit there and figure out how much time you spent on each project. It will do all that for you. Really nice little service there that you might want to look at. Okay, I don't know how I lived so long without this one. Uh, if you're browsing GitHub repositories all the time, kind of going back and forth, it's kind of annoying because when you click into a particular folder, you have to go back and then you have to go dig into it again. Octotree adds uh, a folder list to the side of every GitHub repo. It's a very easy way to, it's a, it's a Chrome extension. And a very easy way to navigate GitHub repositories. And there's also this one called Prism Tree View. So if you use the Prism Syntax Highlighter, then this will actually allow you to create a tree view in a, maybe documentation or even a tutorial on your website or something. And using ASCII like this is how we normally do folder structure, but it will actually convert that to a nice looking folder structure like that. So you just write the ASCII version and it will convert it like that. So it's like a, a syntax highlighter for um, a folder tree. Uh, okay, this is the best one of the bunch for sure. This is called drum commit. It will play a drum roll sound every time you do a commit, a checkout, or a push. It, I like what it says there. It says it shows your coworkers that you're working hard by playing different sounds. So, <laughs> really useful. You're all gonna install that tomorrow morning. Okay, so <laughs> that's that's all for the the tools that I'm gonna feature. It seems kind of overwhelming, doesn't it? And that's just literally just scratching the surface of what I've come across uh, in my, my research over the last couple of years. So in a way, we kind of feel like we're in a, a Cambrian explosion of web tools. Um, Firebug, it seemed like Firebug was the only tool we had like 10 years ago. Uh, GitHub was, was open around, opened around uh, 2009, 2010, and then HTML5 boilerplate indicated there was around 2010 as well. Uh, and it seems like ever since then, that's when the explosion kind of started and we see this just upswing and tools being released every week. So in two years, I've come across well over 60 front-end frameworks, well over 150 JavaScript libraries. Like I'm talking about actual libraries, not just little utilities. Utilities go up to 300 plus. CSS tools, 400. But this is just the research of one dude <laughs> over the last two years. 
just a, a ridiculous amount of tools I've come across. It's just madness. It really is. So is it really so bad, though? Well, like I said, until about 2009 or so, we didn't have a lot of options. I think now, though, we have more choice, and that means we have more quality. So even though it's hard to kind of go through everything, generally speaking, if something is popular, it's, it's pretty safe to say that it's got good quality, especially because it's open source and things just keep on improving. A perfect example of this is the HTML5 boilerplate. Uh, you can see the old website there and the new one. Uh, the code itself has changed drastically, and yet you could even use the, the original one. It was still a pretty good product, and you could use it today, the original one, and it's still pretty effective. Um, the, the font on the website changed. Paul Irish, uh, Paulus's fondness with the font there. Molot, the world will never be the same. Um, but the point is, things improve. Uh, over the last five years, boilerplate has improved quite a bit. So you can learn from these tools. View the source on GitHub. Maybe they're using some JavaScript patterns you've never seen before, or maybe a pattern you've wanted to use, but you haven't quite gotten around to it. Maybe there's some interesting DOM methods being used or some bizarre coding practice you've never seen. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of Adi Osmani's popular book, JavaScript Design Patterns. That's available for free online. Again, there'll be a link at the end where you can find that. Uh, he discusses things like the constructor pattern, the module pattern, the factory pattern, and so on. Again, maybe you haven't used one of these before and you'll come across a library that's using something like this and that'll help you to maybe understand it better. So lots of tools out there, lots of uh, knowledge out there, and it becomes more effective for us. A similar book that's uh, really useful for understanding the DOM, DOM Enlightenment by Cody Lindley. Um, maybe you'll come across some interesting DOM method in, used in some library when you're viewing the source. Have you ever heard of these DOM methods? I didn't hear them until you know, maybe like less than a year ago or something. Um, whatever the case might be, something that you haven't come across before just by viewing the source. A couple of years ago, I was looking at the source for jQuery boilerplate. So this is a, a plugin boilerplate for jQuery plugins. And I noticed just something odd that uh, I had never seen before. It was just a semicolon at the start of the file. So most experienced JavaScript developers will understand what that is, but if you're just getting started with JavaScript and you see something like that, you might not know what it is, or, or you might not fully understand it. You might say, wait, that's a pretty good idea, and then they explain that that's just uh, as a precaution for when uh, scripts are automatically concatenated and maybe somebody didn't put a, a proper semicolon at the end of the last file. Just a very simple thing that you can learn from just by viewing source. Uh, earlier I showed you this one. So how do they do it? You know, that's something that you might see. You, you might say, well, how do they do that? I couldn't figure out at first how they would actually change a fav icon. Would you create all 99 numbers or whatever and then input those? But they're actually using the Canvas API, HTML5 Canvas. So they're drawing the original fav icon, and then they're just using the fill text method of the, of the Canvas API and just filling in uh, the number dynamically. I'm not sure how good the performance is on that, but hey, you learn something how you can actually accomplish something like that, changing a fav icon. The animation library I showed you earlier, the CSS animations API, how do they do that? How do they grab the specifically the CSS animations? Well, they use something called the CSS rule API, which is an actual standard. And you can see it there. Uh, that's the object they're basing it on, and then they're checking to find the, uh, the key things, rules. Uh, they're kind of parsing the JavaScript. You can see some code there. Uh, so again, just view the source of some of these projects. You might not use all of them, but check it out. Check them out and just see if you can learn something and then check out the documentation for those particular features. So the lesson, we might not use a tool, but we can definitely learn from these tools. So how can we keep up? Well, my newsletter, as well as some of the ones listed here, are some of my favorites. Um, Show Hacker News is pretty good, too, for finding some obscure stuff. And I really like the front end Dev Weekly. That's a kind of a newer one, and he's got some really cool stuff there. And everyone should read Web Platform Daily. Um, that was a really nice one too. Not necessarily for tools, but just for front end standards, Web Platform standards in general. And he also has some tools and stuff in there as well. So that's it. Uh, thanks for everything. So that's the URL, tinyurl.com/fitc to the TO 2015. Go to that URL and you'll get everything, um, just don't crack my server, and you'll get everything uh, that I mentioned here in this talk. 
Um, are there any CSS beginners in our audience? Anyone? Okay, the person who put their hand up there. Who was that? Yeah, I have a I have a copy of my book if you want. Come up and see me after a free book. I also have my other book, the HTML5 and CSS3 for the real world. If anyone's kind of a little more uh, familiar with that stuff and wants to learn the new stuff, maybe you haven't gotten into the new stuff as much, uh, come up and see me and I can give you a copy of that as well. I only have one of each, so just, uh, yeah, anyone wants to come up and see me for that particular one. So, uh, thanks. That's it for me.